Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. Start your day tomorrow with the Daily Dog with Michelle Forto, the morning podcast on Dog Works Radio. Apple podcast reviewer Patty Christensen calls it funny, smart, and filled with all the info I want to know about dogs. I love this show. Wake up with the Daily Dog, available on Dog Works Radio on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your shows. Mushing Radio presents the 1925 Serum Run. Remember to subscribe to Mushing Radio so you don't miss an episode. Catch up with previous episodes on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, or at mushingradio.com. Previously on the 1925 Serum Run. In January 1925, Dr. Curtis Welch of Nome notices an uptick of patients with severe coughs. After several deaths, he determines that the cause is diphtheria. An epidemic of diphtheria is almost inevitable here. Stop. I am in urgent need of one million units of diphtheria antitoxin. Stop. The Board of Health unanimously votes for a dog sled relay to bring 300,000 units of antitoxin from Anchorage to Nome. A carefully wrapped 20-pound package of antitoxin is put on a northbound train where it meets the first dog sled team outside Fairbanks. It's 50 degrees below zero when the train reaches the first dog team of Wild Bill Shannon. It may have made more sense to wait until morning, but Shannon says, if people are dying, let's get started. No mayor George Maynard sends out anxious missives to reporters, sometimes exaggerating conditions because he knows it will make a better story and attract more attention to Nome's urgent plight. Meanwhile in Nome, legendary musher Leonard Seppala sets out with a team of 20 dogs determined to mush to the halfway point, turn around and mush back to Nome with the antitoxin. More consideration is given to the idea of sending additional antitoxin by air, but Territorial Governor Bone realizes the dog sled relay is still the best way to transport the antitoxin. But to speed things up, he authorizes funds to increase the number of dog teams and drivers. Charlie Evans gets the antitoxin in Bishop Mountain and sets out with his team. They face the coldest temperatures of the entire trail, 64 degrees below zero. But even with those conditions, there is movement of ice and the overflow of water that comes up from cracks in the Yukon River. This leads to ice fog, which decreases visibility to near zero. Evans has to trust his dogs to keep going, and they do. But in a rush to keep the serum moving, Evans neglects to protect the legs and genitals of his two lead dogs, who are mixed breeds that don't have enough fur to protect them. The dogs get colder and colder. Afraid he won't be able to get them going again if he stops, Evans pushes forward. And then, one of his dogs drops. A moment later, his second lead dog goes down. Evans puts the two dogs in his sled bag and keeps going, but he can't get his dog team moving again. So Evans throws a harness over his shoulder and acts as his own lead dog, getting the team to Nalata. He brings the two fallen dogs in to warm by the fire, but it's too late. They're both dead, having given their lives to keep the antitoxin heading to Nome. Asked decades later about his role in the 1925 serum run, Charlie Evans looked into the distance and said, it was really cold. Tommy Patsy takes the antitoxin from Nalato to Caltag, 36 miles. This week, Portage and the Spirits. In Caltag, Tommy Patsy hands the antitoxin to a dog driver known as Jack Screw, whose real name may have been Jack Nikolai, or perhaps that's just his Americanized name. From Caltag, the trail heads inland, leaving the mighty Yukon behind and heading through the mountains to the coastal town of Unalakleet. The Portage Trail has been used by natives for thousands of years. It was discovered and used by fur traders back when Alaska was a Russian territory and continues to be used to this day by snow machiners and Iditarod mushers. Mushers will sometimes tell you that it's a completely different environment once you hit the coast. The long trip along the Yukon offers challenges, but they're different challenges from the ones found on the Bering Sea. 
The 80 miles or so between Caltag and Unalakleet represent a kind of no man's land where the slow shift between the Yukon River and the Bering Coast sometimes seems to warp reality itself. From Caltag, the trail climbs up, gaining 800 feet of elevation. It's not a steep climb, but it's steady over the course of about 15 miles. And that 15 miles can get long. The trail winds through the woods to the top and then begins a long, long, slow descent into a gorgeous valley. For centuries, there have been stories about this area. Strange things reportedly happen here. Modern Iditarod mushers report frequent hallucinations in the area. They have conversations with people who aren't present and sometimes see things they later realize could not possibly exist. Surely some of this is due to the fact that modern mushers reached this part of the trail exhausted from days of little sleep and a need for downtime after many, many hours where they're required to be far more mentally alert than they're actually capable. And yet, these stories occur so frequently that it's hard to dismiss them all. Jack Screw, an Athabascan, takes the serum from Caltech. He and his team climb up in the evening of January 30th, 1925. From the summit, there's an amazing view of the valley and out towards the coast. Many mushers will stop there to snack their dogs, observe the natural beauty, and contemplate their place in a gorgeous, frozen world. Jack Screw does not pause. The darkness provides little to see that morning, and he's familiar with the area and its views. His focus is solidly on the trail and his dog team, and he's determined to take the antitoxin about halfway to Unalakleet, stopping at Old Woman Shelter and getting there safely, but as quickly as he can. There are many legends about the old woman. Some say she was killed in an avalanche, perhaps cursed for doing men's work surveying up in the mountains. Others say she's a shape-shifting spirit who can appear as a bear or a wolf. And some say the spirit is benevolent and protective, but others insist she's spiteful. One man reported being awakened by her spirit during a particularly cold night. And had she not awakened him, he would have certainly frozen to death. Today, there is a Bureau of Land Management cabin open to all who pass by called Old Woman Cabin. It's located about a mile away from the original Old Woman's shelter. Custom has it that mushers must leave a small offering of food at the cabin for the old woman. Otherwise, she will chase them all the way to Nome and bad luck will follow them for the rest of their trip. Longtime Iditarod musher Didi Genro reports hearing strange sounds around Old Woman Cabin, like humming or whistling. When she's asked if it's just the wind whistling through old wooden structures, she says no, it's a tune with notes that are soothing and seductive. Some Iditarod mushers report being lulled to sleep there and sleeping themselves right out of contention for the race. Many mushers report seeing and smelling fires when there's no one around. Didi Genro says she reminds herself in that portion of the trail not to stop, not to look, not to tempt the fates or the tricky spirits. Perhaps it was one of those spirits or the old woman herself who distracted Jake Berkowitz, who badly cut his hand on that portion of the trail, forcing his withdrawal from the 2012 Iditarod. But for others, the spirits are kind. Mushers have reported being awakened just before they fall off their sleds or just before they encounter animals or other trail hazards. Many mushers worried about appearing silly or superstitious won't talk about these type of encounters publicly. But when they're at ease, on or off the trail, the stories flow. More than a few will tell you that they encountered the old woman herself on the trail sometimes in the form of an animal, and sometimes appearing exactly as she was when she was young. 
After four-time Iditarod champion and modern mushing legend in her own right, Susan Butcher died. She had her ashes scattered along various places on the Iditarod Trail, including some at Old Woman Cabin. Her husband, Dave Monson, said Susan always loved Old Woman Cabin and added, people get a spiritual feeling traveling through the area, a shiver like someone is watching you. Early in the morning of January 31st, 1925, Jack Screw arrives at Old Woman Shelter. There, Eskimo musher Victor Anagic is waiting. Ordinarily, there might have been tension. There were centuries of feuding and ill will between the Athabascans and other native groups. Bad feelings lingered, sometimes based on tangible issues like territory or fishing and trapping rights, and other times about real or imagined slights from both sides. It might have been a better idea to have a buffer between the two groups so that cooperation would not be required on the serum run. But that morning, the spirit of the old woman is kind. Both men are determined to do whatever they have to to help the people in Nome. And for the time being, anyway, disagreements are put aside. Victor Anagic warms the antitoxin briefly, then sets out for Unalakleet and the coast, where a whole new set of challenges await. Already, the wind is picking up, and the most difficult part of the journey is almost at hand. Meanwhile, although no one quite knows exactly where he is, Leonard Seppala and his large team of huskies head south, still fully prepared to go all the way to Nalato and back to Nome. Mushers along the route have been told to keep an eye out for Seppala, but so far none have spotted him. As the wind picks up and a storm blows in, that is about to change. Next week, howling winds on the Bering Sea and the handoff. This has been the 1925 Serum Run on Mushing Radio. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forda and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com. Hi guys, it's Alex. If you are a fan of sled dog sports in the Iditarod, Mushing Radio is the show for you. Each Wednesday, we drop a new episode on Dog Works Radio. So be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. If you like our podcast, there are a few things you can do. You can take a couple of minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. You can also check out all of our DogWorks Radio sponsors and promotions in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go over to Facebook, like our Facebook page, and one last thing, please tell all of your friends by spreading the word about DogWorks Radio. Thank you so much for listening to us. We really appreciate you. DogWorks Radio is produced by Robert Forto. Logo art by Angry Squirrel Studios. DogWorks Radio is produced in conjunction with KVRF 89.7 in Palmer, Alaska. For dog training advice, you can contact Alaska DogWorks at 907-841-1686 or visit their website at alaskadogworks.com. If you have a show idea or would like to be a guest, please contact us by sending an email to live at dogworksradio.com.